I can see you. There we go. I got you. Jeez Louise. Son of a gun. Tech man. Well, I was thinking right before we went on, it's so convenient how I was in Mexico last week. No problem. You're in New York this week. No problem. But then we hit a problem. Except boom, wheels fell off. Who would have, who would have thought that New York would have caused the wheels to fall off? I don't think it did. I think it was Riverside. Riverside's stinking. yeah, new tech. Stinking Val. That's what happens. Um, are you in the exact same room that you were in last time we recorded in New York? The exact same room, sitting in the exact same chair. Do you stay in the exact same hotel every time you go to New York? This, thankfully, is not a hotel. This is the wonderful, huge, awesome Upper West Side, upper west side apartment of a great friend. Very nice. Do they stay? Are they in the apartment as well, or do they just let you have the keys? She is here. She is here, but it's a... Yeah, like a magical for New York. I think it's a four bedroom apartment that Crazy. one of the one of the bedrooms converted into the larger living room. But yeah, three bedrooms, great spot, boom and views of the city right off the park. Makes travel so much easier when you don't have to carry a hotel expense. Oh my goodness. Like, and I'm usually real happy to go to a hotel just for the lack of you know, like sometimes you don't want to to have to engage somebody or whatever. It's just easier to hotel you can be in and out on your own uh except she is awesome so it's feels like coming home to family that is the best i so one time i stayed in new york and it was kind of a last i was in on the east coast driving from place to place um and then i had a free day or two and my buddy was like hey you should just go into new york i have a buddy who can put you up i'm like i don't want to put him out i don't even know the guy and then i'm gonna have to meet him for the first time yeah. and stay in awkward. his apartment with uh, him super awkward yeah. right but I did want to go to New York. So I start looking up um, hotel prices and it was like the, the lowest was up 500 bucks, you know? Yeah. And it was like anything decent was six, seven, 800 bucks. So I text my buddy back and I'm like, Hey, can I still use that, <laughs> that apartment <laughs> hookup? He goes, yeah, no problem. So he puts me in contact with his buddy. His buddy had two apartments in the same building and goes, oh yeah, you can use mine. I'm going to go stay in the other one upstairs. No problem at all. I never even had to interact with him. I stayed in his apartment, never met him before, had full reign of the place. And he was, that's how kind and polite they were about the whole thing. I love the person who understands, hey man, you're here to stay. You're not here to make a new friend. You and I are going to have, you know, we'll be cordial. But we don't need to make a lasting bond here. This is all cool. Truly the best people on the planet right there. My goodness. My, like those people, I have such gratitude in my heart for those people. I'll just almost tear up thinking about the times in my life that somebody's tossed me the keys or done something without the like, hey, let's really also go get a long lingering meal or something. This is, in fact the exact reason why I love our podcast community is because these, I feel like they're intimate relationships that we have with so many people that DM and message, except I never have to see them in real life. And it's beautiful that there's no, I never feel there's like a big expectation. Like it's always just, Hey man, we all live in this world. Yes. We're all kind of laughing about the same things. Uh, let's share in this experience, but let's not load each other down with hefty expectations. That's exactly what it is. If I, if I had this many friends that are on my phone through the internet in real life, I wouldn't be able to go to the grocery store. I wouldn't be able to get coffee. I'd be stopping Ever. and having conversations all day, every day, which is the bane of my existence when it actually does happen. And so the fact that they're all contained within this little magic box and I can chime in when I want or not, and they can do the exact same thing. We send each other love all the time. Like we all know we're kind of connected. It feels like you have, you know, intimate friendships, except without all, without all the, uh, the annoyance. It's like a dating app. It really is. <laughs> it really is. That's how I met my wife. <laughs> It's a real, real modern world. Uh, by the way, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but um, when I met Lauren, when we were on the dating app, it's a logical progression is your message, you connect with somebody on the app and then yeah. you go to messaging on the app. And then the next thing is let's um, 
text. Let's swap numbers, get off the app and text in real life to kind of set up the date. And then you yeah. meet in person. So that's the progression. When we were messaging on the app, I said, Hey, let me get your number and you know, we can set up a date. I, she did, she gave me her number. I messaged her, said, Hey, let's go on a date this weekend. You know, let me know which day works best, whatever. Fully got ghosted. She never Nothing. texted me back. No, this Ooh. was like on a Wednesday and I was setting up the date for, let's say Friday, Saturday. By the time Sunday rolled around, had my tail between my legs, fully like, all right, I guess whatever, you know, you don't, you don't, you try not to get your feelings hurt because maybe they were already on date three with somebody else. And that was going really well. It's not that they don't like you. It's just that they were already on date three with somebody else and they have to pursue that could be anything. Right. And also though, you try to maintain dignity by not chasing somebody when they've already ghosted you once, you know? Yeah. So nine times out of 10, I would never get back on the app and message that exact person who gave me a fake phone number or who chose to ghost me. Right. But for whatever reason, I swallowed my pride and that Sunday night got back on the app and messaged her again and was just like, Hey, I don't know if it was a mistake or not, but you gave me a number. I messaged that number on Wednesday and I never heard back. She immediately replied on the app. She goes, oh my gosh, I just read that message and I gave you the wrong number by one digit. Like the last digit was transposed. And, and so I apologize. I thought that you ghosted me. And I was like, no, I wanted to go out with you. She's like, I'm so sorry. You gave me the right number and the rest is history. Have you ever seen the movie Sliding Doors with Gwyneth Paltrow and whoever the dude is? The Great Sliding Doors, yeah. It's a class, I feel it's Sliding Doors. I watched it not that long ago again, rewatched it. And I don't know that it necessarily holds up, but that con, I, like, I'm a big rom-commer. I think we've talked about this, especially on a flight. Like, if there is a rom-com on a flight, that is the movie I watch. My whole brain has turned to such mush in the air that I can't take any action adventure. I can't move that quick. Uh, I can't take any drama because I can't think about anything. I need the dumbest form of entertainment, which is the rom-com, right? Totally, yeah. Uh, but Sliding Doors, yeah, the concept for people who haven't watched it, Gwen Paltrow, she either makes the train, or the, I guess it's the tube in London, or doesn't. And then the two scenarios where her life unfolds in different ways. Which is, honestly, it's a concept that, could be done over and over and over again. Like they could make this movie a million different versions of it because it's really true. It's like, there's so many instances in your life that are uh, feathering on just kind of teetering one, one way or the other. And they have drastically different results if you go one direction instead of the other. I mean, it's crazy. The thought that if you would have never messaged yeah. Lauren back, if you would have swallowed the pride, it would have been done forever. That totally. would have been uh, over. Or... In an alternate kind of theory, fate plays a role and then connects you next week in a different way at a coffee shop or something like that, you know? Meant to be, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, hey, as it relates to surfing, this is The Grit for June 16th, <laughs> 2023. The El Salvador, whatever it's called, uh, has Live. just Surf started. Surf City Pro. Surf City Pro, right. Just started. Finals day just started. The uh, semifinals are in the water for the women, and then it'll go semifinals men while we're here recording. Did you open it up to uh, see what the conditions look like? I looked at the uh, you small YouTube window, yeah. and I saw enough to let me turn it right off. Is it? Did I miss something? It's bad. Yeah. <laughs> we don't yeah. need We don't need to do a whole negative show harping on the WSL yet again. But suffice to say, uh, they need to run. It's just, it's well documented. There's all the evidence is in. The WSL needs to shift entirely and run in good waves. Even when the waves were, quote, good for El Salvador early in the event, they're not world-class. No. And so we saw all of the world-class surfers I mean, you know, the most finely tuned surfers for world-class waves get dispatched in the early rounds. Kelly Slater, John John, Jack Robinson. Uh, Yago think, Dora. Yeah, your guy, you're out. Done, out, done. Dustin, <laughs> oh, can you still get ouch. into the Losers League? I don't know. I don't know. I, don't I probably either. will try, but I, I can't imagine. That would be unfair to swing into the yeah. Losers League and only have to win two or whatever. But uh, yeah, no, sad, well, sad day. Yeah. So 
you know, it just, I watched when the waves were good and they're, you know, the uh, Griffin Colapintos of the world are really ripping. And I thought, this is as entertaining as some other surf clips that I can get on any given day of the week, but this is not what we should be striving for with the World Surf League. And then the um, Stab Magazine just published a premium article yesterday, I believe, talking about how the El Salvadorian government is making a huge play to attract surf tourism. So that's why the ISA games are there. They're, that's why the WSL is there. They're throwing millions of dollars to at these events to support them. Whereas the WSL wants to maybe host an event at Cloudbreak and it costs them millions of dollars to do and they can't figure out a business model. They can't get a sponsor essentially for the event to then offset the costs. So it just makes a lot of business, financial, fiscal decision for them to run, you know, sense for them to run in El Salvador. But I read that article and I go, hey, great for El Salvador, super smart move. They know what they're doing. You know who doesn't know what they're doing in this scenario? The WSL, who has the most rare, beautiful gemstone in the world in professional surfing with the greatest athletes on the planet ready to go at a moment's notice. And the WSL can't figure out how to put those surfers in the best waves and then monetize it. And so for them to take the low hanging fruit of, oh, whoever's offering, dollars. yeah, exactly, is an insane way to run the business. In fact, it's making you liable. It's making you vulnerable to other people's best interests and for you to pull your pants down. You know what I mean? And that's what's happening in this scenario. And the fact that, and then there's the bloated scenario, the bloated thing that we always talk about, which is the tour is too big and now they have to run finals day in three foot waves where there's only one set every 20 minutes. It's all a mess. I mean, and the couple things like the World Surf League, it's back to bud tour days, right? It's back to let's go to where we can attract a crowd. Huntington Beach, you know, like Daytona in Florida, whatever. It doesn't matter what the surf is. doesn't matter if the wave is one foot big. We need to attract a crowd on the beach in order to sell merch or whatever. However, right. those days worked. Now it's like, okay, which, which uh, tourism board is going to pay us? We, you know, we got Margaret River. We have, uh, we have now El Salvador. So two of the events on tour are tourism board, you know, funded and used to, but it doesn't matter where those waves are. If a tourism board in anywhere, like yeah. a, any tourism board said, hey, if Tijuana's tourism board said, hey, we want to figure this out. W sell how much to do the, you know, Tijuana Slough Pro. Yeah. Uh, WSL would say, great, you know, and that would be, and the, real silly i mean not that it's silly but the inability of them to speak any kind of truth and so then you know you just get this wall of positive noise around like yeah el salvador looks really fun if when the surfers are paddling out into waves like so they have the drone shot or whatever right and you'll see a set and you think oh that looks good and then it'll kind of zoom in on it and i think oh that's a wave that i would really enjoy surfing if i'm watching a pro paddle out into a wave that i would like something is wrong with that scenario, right? Like, not that I want them to just only, see, or only want to see death defying stuff or whatever, but yeah. I don't want to see where a pro really shines is not where I really shine. Exactly. I shine exactly on that El Salvador stuff, like a shoulder high runner that's not really top to bottom, right? It's like yeah. a shoulder high where I can build up my speed, you know, and I can work on my cool, turn and whatever like but to have these pros there to have the best in the world there and then but also be selling it perpetually right you got all of the team behind how brilliant it is and genius it is and El, this is el salvador this is a surf paradise don't you wish you could be down there everybody's out there mind surfing this you know blah de, blah de, blah de, blah it just gets it, the absurdity is again we are dying days but this is how it goes down. It goes down with tourism boards and bad decisions and stupidity. It really, yeah, it's insane that we're even explaining this, that, that we even have to explain the difference between Punta Roca versus Cloudbreak. And to, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's so obvious, but we're so far in the mire now that, I don't know, it is a total level of absurdity that I never anticipated.
Nope. Um, but I, I just got a text from Sid Abruzzi right before we started exactly stating this, just like, hey, epic finals day, huh? He's like, it looks like <laughs> a crappy day at Ruggles, um, which reminded me his documentary is finally finished. It and sure is. Is it have, out yet? It's not out yet. Have, I just uh, saw the some, poster. Yeah, the posters they published, I think, on Instagram and a friend of mine or a friend of the show, I guess, a listener, uh, messaged and said that he watched a screening of it and it's epic. Uh, I mean, I, I absolutely don't doubt it. I cannot wait to see this movie. Yeah, me neither. Um, I mean, it's, it is the best story that has never been told properly. Sid's story. And I've had him on the podcast a couple of times and um, we've spent some time with him, you and I both the layers and layers and layers and layers, you know what I mean? Like it was kind of like spending time with Dick Metz where we spend hours together and that only brings us up to 1964. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, Oh my gosh, dude. So Sid is equally as interesting and just plugged in, in so many kind of important culturally, like shift culture shifting moments with it, with important people. So I, I think mean, it'll be Sid really is- good. Sid is the exact uh, opposite. He is everything the World Surf League is not. Like, totally. I mean, everything that they're not. Like, from core to great opinions to interesting personality to all of it. Like, to not greenwashing or sports washing or doing anything. To actually doing the real work, right? Like, I mean, the stuff that Sid has done. Yeah, I cannot wait for this film to come out. And for sure, I mean... Of course, uh, Robert De Niro now is too old to play Sid, but there's got to be some young Italian actor coming up who will do the feature film justice. Well, you know when um, you see that those ac- those famous actors have a son who looks remarkably similar and even has yeah. like the same voice. Like I remember when that um, Ice Cube was it Ice Cube? Yeah, Ice yeah. Cube's son. <laughs> Yep. was in that and it was like oh my gosh how did they get a guy that looks so much like ice cube or james gandolfini's son in the uh saints of newark or whatever that movie was the spinoff movie for the sopranos same i mean you thing. just wow you get somebody who looks exactly like young james gandolfini yeah how'd you do it yes robert de niro hopefully he oh, i think he does have a son i'm sure he has a bunch <laughs> yeah he just has a new baby too Him no that's al, pa- that's al pacino right oh uh, Ro- i think robert de niro had one too did he really? Yeah. Those dogs, man. But yeah, oh. so th- that would be the ultimate, I think, uh, scenario for me that I would love to see play out is this documentary is as good as we hope that it is. It and that then gets the feature film deal. Yeah, that would be amazing. Okay. And it would be, um, I think Sid Sid deserves it for the life that he earned. For sure. I mean, Sid's all, already had to have been approached by all kinds of Hollywood folk saying, hey, man, will turn your story into blah de blah. Hope he yeah. gets the right one. Yeah, for sure. That's what it comes down to ultimately because I, yeah, I think he probably has been approached, but it's a matter of picking the right fit. Uh, but Sidabruzzi, for those who don't know, Rhode Island, Water Brothers is what you should go look for on Instagram, Water Bros. Um, iconic surf shop in, in uh, Rhode Island. And then while we're talking about films, we should also state the Florida Surf Film Festival is underway this weekend. If you haven't been, are there still tickets available? I don't know if the tickets are or not, but definitely go to floridasurffilmfestival.com if you live anywhere near New Smyrna and um, check that out. It is truly the best, one of the best surf shows in town in terms of like vibe, in terms of the entertainment, of course, the way that both John and Kevin run that thing. It is a well-oiled machine that, yeah, every time I've been, it makes me think, This is how come other people aren't doing this? This is so good. It's so fun. It's such a great community. And the, I guess it goes sometimes without, or it goes without me stating it, but their ability to curate the right movies is like really worth going for. Like they set up, it's like going to a Michelin star restaurant and having, you know, the right order of come out before the right main force, et cetera, et cetera. Like it is a delectable collection. That is a great analogy, by the way, because I totally agree. It's not just getting the right, you know, we have a bunch of films where we're going to host them. It's the entire presentation of everything, 
by the way, all of the graphic design work from uh, Tom, I mean, all of it, like it all fits, uh, you know, a uh, over our overachieving, overarching goal that somebody has designed. Phenomenal event. It really is. Um, uh, one of the films, I don't know, it's a short film. I think it's going to be on YouTube so anybody could see it, but it's called Stoker Machine. It's so good. Um, Who's in it? It's funny. There was a film that I loved when I was young by Chad Campbell called The Fifth Symphony Document. And it was kind of um, somewhat underground, but it was a, a Big Island guy, Chad Campbell, who um, leaned on his friends. So it's some underground, like Conan Hayes was in the film. and But then there was an epic Rob Machado section, I think at Reunion Island. Kelly Slater was in the film. They were in uh, somewhere in Australia with Eddie Vedder, you know, but it wasn't, it was low production value. And so it felt very intimate. It was like, man, why is Eddie here? Cause it was like, before we all knew that they were friends, you know, and that yeah. Eddie surfed. So I was like, man, what's Eddie doing here with Kelly? And, and Chad happened to be there to document everything and made a really kind of intimate, small, epic surf film. And I always loved it, but not a lot of people had seen it. So when I met up uh, with the Florida Surf Film Festival guys, Kevin Miller happened to mention that that was one of his favorite films too. And I was like, oh my gosh. Oh. There was one guy in the film, Big Island guy named Darius Legg, who got a couple of waves. It was the only time I'd ever seen him. I'd never seen him in a magazine, never seen him in a film before or since. But anyways, Darius Legg is now a filmmaker and he turned the camera on Chad Campbell, who made the Fifth Symphony document. And the whole film, it's a short film, 15 minutes maybe, about a board called the Stoker Machine that Chad Campbell got like at a garage sale, like this yellow beater. And the film is about um, finding the origins of that board. Like it said Stoker Machine on it. And he's like, and the board was not only yellow and a beater, but like a weird design. And it just, you would never think that it would work, but for whatever reason, it worked phenomenally well. And so Chad fell in love with this board and set out to find the origins of who shaped it, how they named it, all that sort of stuff. And um, it's, I didn't know that Darius was into filmmaking now, but this was like an unbelievably well-made short film and had incredible animation, the storyline, the music, all the shots, the cinematography, all of it, I was really blown away by so, um, yeah, I loved it and it should be on YouTube, like I said, so I'll, I'll post it if I can find it today or I'll direct people to it when it is available. Hey, I mean, if it's available, I'll stick it on beach grip. That sounds incredible. It really is. And Chad Campbell, um, I think the Florida surf film festival had him out because they loved that old film so much. And so he's popped up now. I think he listens to this show and stuff. So I see him on Instagram sometimes, but anyways, the Florida surf film festival, well worth checking out. We appreciate all the work they do. Um, and talking about good work that they do, they're hosting this past week, a filmmaker retreat, if you can believe that. So it's not just as they host these festivals, you know, quarterly on the weekends, they do other things like this to invest into the filmmaking community. So they had Taylor Steele, of all people, the Taylor Steele, the Taylor Steele, come down for a week and host a filmmakers retreat at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. And um, the woman who actually lives in New York, who does our video editing, Michelle, she submitted her resume to them and got invited to the retreat. So she's been down there this week, hanging out with John and Kevin and uh, Taylor Steele working on a project. How much better are our videos going to look when she comes back? It's going totally. to be so good. <laughs> totally. She's got a concept, by the way, that, um, believe it or not, we kind of pitched here years ago and she loved it and she's run with it and she's got a treatment for it and she's pitching it to Taylor and it may come to fruition at some point. What was it? Or can we, can we not say? I don't know if I should say it yet or not. It's yeah, probably worth keeping under wraps, but for true fans, we've touched on this concept as a potential gold mine of a film feature and uh she's running with it and she mentioned she's looking for a director Chaz and your name was in the mix oh fantastic be good if it was our idea <laughs> coming off <laughs> coming off the success of the who is J-O-B and uh trouble of course the Lisa Lisa Anderson film well great give her my information we will do has she has it um all right we've got a listener line call remember last week we were talking about 
Crows in the Wild. Yes. We've a got great a great new segment. We've got a submission here. The other day on your last uh, podcast, you, you talked about a Crows in the Wild um, idea. And, and when I heard that, it really just brought something to mind, to a memory back to me that just I, I will never get out of my head. It was so, it was so visual. It was so visceral, too. Um, Maui, it was 1990. I, I was serving Honolulu Bay a bunch, and you know, there were some pretty good days in the, in the winter was out there one day, really pretty, pretty solid day. And I, I got in one, I was paddling back up the point. I look up and, you know, this guy is, he's going backside and he had rolled in away on the outside and he is moving so fast. He's just, he was at the top part of the wave, just doing these little turns and generating so much speed. And, you know, the next thing you know it, I, he is right in this inside section. The inside section is so hollow it is the gaping tube that like as far as it is tall it is a, just this solid little tube and he just he's coming off the bottom and what booze he just bashes the lip in this hollowest part of the way that's so hollow it's this giant tube how do you even do that at a tube and he comes back off the bottom and what booze just bashes again and that's that third time booze hits it in all of this quickest speed so short small period of time that he smacks the lip in this most insane you know part of the wave and it was it was Derek Ho and it just well I can just visual I can still see it now in my mind it was incredible the amount of speed it was incredible um yeah <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to uh to share this with you uh keep up the work adios how good is that that's exactly what this segment is for right here. Booge. That was Booge. perfect. <laughs> the, the real truth is what, what makes uh, pros in the wild so great is when you see a pro in the wild, like you can be out, and I think we probably talked about this before, but you can be out <clears throat> wherever surfing with the people who are good at your spot and you know who those people are, right? Like you have, or and or you can always sense somebody, oh, that guy's good and you or girl's good and you watch him or her do their good surfing. And then a pro comes out and you realize that nobody exists on the level of pros, right? Like a proper A-grade pro surfer is so ridiculously good that their kind of surfing is not even the same sport as our kind of surfing. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly it. There's so many different tiers of talent. It's hard to even fathom what a Kelly Slater or a John John are doing, you know? And when you see, like, like you just stated, but I mean, I grew up in surfing Huntington Beach all the time. So every pro in the planet would come through at least once a year. And during the summertime, getting ready for the U.S. Open, that's when all these QS warriors come out. But then there will also be the world champs that show up for that event traditionally, maybe not so much anymore. But so I remember the local pros who were shredding when I was growing up, uh, Jeff Deffenbaugh, you know, and then the younger guys, Micah Byrne, stuff like that. Yeah. I'm looking at just, I can't, I'll never be at that level. That is the pinnacle of surfing to me. And then the uh, U.S. Open comes to town and Aaron Aaron Buru or Aritz Aaron Buru paddles out and Gobi Goni Zubi Zaretta, you know, and I'm just like, <laughs> whoa, those guys are literally two or three times better than our local pros. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then, and then Kelly Slater shows up and you're just like, oh my gosh. And I'm talking about surfing uh gutless crappy huntington you know <laughs> once you actually see those guys in good surf which i remember he was talking so that call he's talking about Derek ho going straight into the lip with speed and force on a hollow section. hollow section which is remember, which is anybody who surfs that's like terrifying kind of the, the thought of doing anything other than tugging in when it gets real hollow is scary well, when you're a, an intermediate or beginning level surfer, if you even see a wave start to go hollow, 
you try to tuck in because your only yeah. goal in life has been to get barreled. You would never think about bottom turning into that thing. You just want to get that tube. And it turns out to never be a tube. It to- turns out to be, you know, a pocket ride essentially. Yeah. But what he's talking about, I remember seeing a lesser version of in Newport with Matt Archibald, where, you know, it was like maybe head high, but scary to me, square kind of tubes, beach break tubes close to shore. And Matt Archibald doing that exact thing off the bottom, squaring up with a full pitching lip, just like that thing would have smacked me down so hard and him just going full force into it. It was like watching two heavyweights throw big punches at each other, the wave versus Archie. And I'm watching him bottom turn into the thing going, what is he even thinking? And then just smashes it as hard as you possibly can and actually wins the bout with the wave, you know? And you just go, holy cow, dude. And and that was just a head high wave. That was not Honolulu, you know? Sure. I mean, at least at least this level of talent though is at El Salvador right now surfing three foot waves though. <laughs> but at least that's like the artists, the best artists of our time are in subpar conditions, groveling it out for the El Salvador tourism sports wash. Thank you, WSL. Totally. Uh, by the way, Gabriel, can you hear my mic, by the way? I feel like my audio cut out a little bit. Is it fine? Uh, no, I, yeah, you're good. Okay. It must be my headphones. Um, Gabriel Medina is trouncing Ian Gentile right now. I'm not Gabriel Medina, Felipe Toledo. Okay. So like, I mean, I'm going to say unless Felipe wins, there's going to be riots. So they better push him through. Good, good point. So the, the other thing that maybe we've talked about too ad nauseum is what it does when they run events like this and surf ranch and a bunch of waves that look similar is it just homogenizes um, all of the surfing and allows somebody who's very good at one thing to then win the world title that year. So Felipe Toledo is clearly one of two, maybe three of the best surfers in the world in this type of waves. And he has the advantage now across the entire season because they're not running in diversity of surf. I mean, look at Jack Robinson went out pre quarters. Uh, you talked about it at the top of the show, like the decimation of, you know, John, John, Jack Robinson, like the kind of a more diverse surfer, or at least, yeah, like, I mean, I believe we all know what he can't, we, he can't do and get on him to be afraid of big ledging lefts. But, uh, yeah, like, I, I don't know how you basically just gift the title to Philippe again yeah. this year. Like, if you're finishing in trestles, he doesn't yeah. even have to show up at Chopu at all. Yeah. Uh, he could call in sick. He'll still be what? He'll, if he wins here, he'll be so far ahead. He wouldn't even have to go to Stinkin' J Bay if he didn't want to. Right. Which he will. He does have he's, uh, he's, he's a track record J-Bay. there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but ultimately, it's not, we're not going to learn who the best surfer in the world is this year. We're going to learn who the best surfer is on shoulder high rights, rippable rights. You know, we're going to, we're going to learn that Philippe Toledo can do it again. Exactly. Um, it is worth stating, though, at this point in the year that Kelly Slater was gifted two wild cards in the back half of the season and he got last place at both. I mean, it's truly, I don't know why he's showing up. I mean, other than in El Salvador, is he going to show up in Brazil? I mean, he never yeah. ever goes to Brazil, but yeah, you got to. Th- I wonder if he just feels either bad uh, that he was gifted these or not feel bad. I don't think he feels bad, but if he feels weird or that you know, I mean, I I don't know exactly what the situation is, but I know that those investors in the Kelly Way pool, when the World Surf League bought that, their investment in that transferred to investment in the World Surf League total, right? And so now they're have a stake in the world circling. So that means ostensibly, unless he diversified somehow or divestified, I mean, uh, is, that, is that the word? Divest? Yeah. Think, yeah divest. Divest. Yeah. But I like divestified. That, that's yeah, good too. Uh, unless Kelly divested from it, then he would have an ownership stake in the world circling. Right. And so then I guess ostensibly you could say that's the reason he's going. He knows that it's flagging, uh, that they need all the help they can get and that he is still, you know, the biggest draw or one of the biggest draws on tour. And so even if he's going to go get last, knowing that being in the contest is important for clicks or views or whatever they need, because thing certainly seems like it's circling the drain. Yeah, it definitely does. But they did just sell a wave pool in Abu Dhabi. 
Abu Dhabi. Have you been to Abu Dhabi, David Lee Scales? No, I've never been to that part of the world at all. I, yeah. I mean, I would love to. I'm not against it, but. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, this one This one is billed as the world's largest. It's a Kelly Slater wave pool technology with the, so it's the plow and everything where I don't know, the the lake is a lot bigger, like many times bigger than Lamore. Uh, so I'm assuming there's another way the wave can break to have multiple sections or riders, but that's the thing with Kelly's surf ranch is really you can have one person up and riding unless this thing goes on so long. But still, I mean, that I don't, I suppose I'm stumbling here, but I don't know how this works as a scalable technology where, where hundreds of people can surf a day. Well, it, I think it could have a pool on either side of the train. And so you could get a it left and a right like going. It. Oh, it doesn't? The, I, I from, haven't seen the photos. From, from the one I saw, it seems like the train is on the left side, if you're looking at it, the entire left side of the lagoon. And then the rest of the little lagoon is big and open this way. So I'm imagining, obviously, it's in United Arab Emirates, right? There's not a big, there's a bunch of Australians that live there, but the I mean, local population is really tiny. But the pa Pakistani slaves are not going to go, like, want to get stand-up tubes, right? They'll go, and I'm sure there's a way that it breaks, and there's, like, a boogie soft top section somewhere off to the side. But I, and again, I'm sure they've somehow figured it out, but I don't know how a, it's scalable where multiple you know, tens to hundreds of people can surf a day. Yeah. I, well, I think it's one of the few places in the world where they don't, it doesn't need to be scalable. It doesn't, they don't need tens or hundreds of people to surf it every day. Right. They just need one super rich person who rents it out regularly. And the, there's the enough surf ranch model, but yeah, this exactly. one's huge. This one is huge. This one's like the, one of the biggest man-made lakes or something. It's like yeah. a, it's a gargantuan thing, which again, Let's let's just talk real quick. Can we talk real quick about? Sure. I I just wish between calling El Salvador the best waves in the world while you're actively sports washing a you know dubious government. Let's call El Salvador's government dubious. I got nothing against El Salvador. El Salvador. I would love to go and surf in El Salvador, but a there's some questions about the government. Let's put it that way. Then you are also green one ocean loving the ocean and the earth and you open a world's biggest wave pool in abu dhabi in a desert uh and i can't imagine that it's fresh water i'm sure they're pumping in salt water if they're not then oh, yeah. in a desert you're you know and i guess they could be using desal but still the amount of energy and now it's greenwash it in any way they want but the hypocrisy the abject hypocrisy of the World Surf League is as bad as any big pharma, as any big tobacco. It is as bad a hypocrisy as exists on earth by a corporation. Uh, did you see the structure that they built on the rocks at El Salvador? No. I got to send it to you. Barton Lynch posted it right before he was there for the ISA thing and then left, but they were building it while he was there. They built a permanent structure on the rocks. It's a giant building. It's not a scaffolding. It's actual, I don't know if they built it out of brick or, or like, um, you know, uh, cinder blocks with rebar or what the, what it's built out of, but it is a permanent structure. And anytime you do that on the coast, you are changing erosion, you're changing all kinds of stuff. So I'm all down with doing it. And world, if the World Surf League would just say, hey, look, at, we are not an environmental organization. We are in the business of surf contests. That's what we care about. Of course, we will try to be green when we can. Otherwise, you know, we're flying surfer. We're not gonna, we're not gonna trick you. Like the lies, the bald faced lies to any fan without any recognition of just, no, we are, lying directly to you we will take money from anywhere we don't care from great wall motors from anywhere we can get money we'll take it we'll build wave pools anywhere that will buy it doesn't matter if it flies in the face of if it destroys the environment actively destroys the environment if you throw down the money there's nothing we will turn down like that yeah. level again of hypocrisy and greed is as odious as any of the big corporations that we've, you know, as society kind of held to account. Yeah, totally agree. And um, it just has nothing to do with surfing at this point. 
No, it's just, I mean, it's whether a, it's, it's, whether it's the, we are one ocean thing, or it's the building wave pools in the desert. It's so far removed from quote surfing. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, it's a cancer. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Um, well, Hey, we've got two new kook and current submissions that have been Let's in the hopper for a couple of weeks. Get to them. I'm excited. One of them I've, I've thought about myself. This actually was submitted by two different listeners uh, within the last couple of weeks, but painting your surfboards. Oh, painting your surfboards. This is a good one. It is a good this, one. It's a proper one. Only kooks or currents do it. It's either I'm, Mason Ho or the kook kid who has a spray can. Spray can. I mean, that's the thing. I can't even think of an adult who would do this um, it would be a kid who is learning how to surf and therefore qualifies as a kook, you know, but there's no intermediate surfer on the planet that I've ever seen or seen in the water who had home drawn artwork on their surfboard. It's either, like you said, Mason Ho or some Grom. I have a, a painted surfboard at my house that I stole from one Andrew Doheny. I don't know if Andrew Doheny counts as a current, but I think he probably does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Andrew absolutely shreds. Um, yeah. Why did you, what's the story between about stealing his board? I, he was, I was interviewing him for something at his house and he said uh, that he had shaped this board and it didn't work or something. And it was like four feet big with a bunch of weird channels on it. It's like a totally weird board. And I said, I don't think totally works. I'll show you. And so took it and yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, I've, I haven't seen anything of him for two or three years, but he did get into shaping towards the end of his, let's call it a career. And um, all of those boards look terrible. I mean, and they, yeah. po they publish videos of him surfing them. And I'm like, man, he's an incredible surfer. And that board is limiting all of his abilities. I wonder is, is droid. Is he have a second act? What's he doing these days? So he disappeared for a year or two and then Dane Reynolds and former connected with him and they they gave him, you know, a sponsorship and did a little video talking about he's, this is his second act. Here he comes. And it was one video and he disappeared again. So if he shows Ooh, up, it'll have to be act. a third act. Yeah. Great. Looking forward but I mean, to it. That, that, that explosive style of surfing is what we all want. And we've been talking about that in recent weeks where the definition of an intermediate surfer is never taking risk. It's so true. I mean, and, which is, could, could be the theme of this show between Derek Ho at Honolulu, Matt Archie. Like, that's what, if you really want to get good, or if you really are good, you take risk. Yeah. And if you're not good, you never risk anything. Because if you risk something, you either blow a perfect wave. Like, thinking my times at Surf Ranch, uh, I surfed so conservatively as to be silly, right? And I keep on trying to get radical, but I know getting radical for me is falling. Getting radical equals falling. I think in my life, I've probably accidentally pulled one or two radical maneuvers that I didn't fall on. And it was a pure accident. It was a pure mistake that I stayed on my feet. Uh, and like, which I would imagine is in the in, locked in the intermediate mind. You try, you fail. So your best course of action is to barely try or like push it up, push that turn 2% more, maybe exactly. maximum 2% more. Just do what you know you can do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and Andrew Doheny surfing in contrast, in stark contrast, was just throw everything you possibly can at every single turn. And it ends yeah. up not only being like an explosive blow tail, but he threw so much energy that it whips around into a 360, you know, and then he yeah. finds himself landing it at the bottom and going into another bottom turn. And it's just so exciting to watch, you know? Sure is. Um, so painting your, but you're right. He's a guy who would definitely paint his surfboards. By the way, I love your analogy about artistry and their lack thereof at uh, El Salvador. Yeah. Because I was thinking about that too with that call. And now we're thinking about it with Andrew Doheny, which is, when you see a pro in the wild, it is, that's, you're seeing an, a genius level artist at their, doing their craft 
And you don't get to see that in any other realm of the world. You know, like we've talked about, you don't, LeBron James doesn't show up at your local basketball court and play a pickup game. We know that, but you also don't get to see Damien Hurst making a painting, you know, yeah. you, and I guess the closest analogy might be what you said with dining in a Michelin rated restaurant where, but the chef is in the kitchen, you're eating their food. You're not really in the kitchen watching them do their thing. Being a surfer, Aska in New York. You should go to Aska in New York, David Lee Scales. What Aska, is that? A-S-K-A. Did you oh, go man. there last night? Oof, not last night. Last time I was here, though, it was... Did I talk about it on the show? No. Oh, guys, Frederick is the chef. Uh, he is Swedish, but friend of a friend, and now we're friends. Snowboarder, awesome guy. Like, shredded with him and Jackson. Couldn't be a better guy. Has a two Michelin stars... Uh, for Aska in his restaurants in Brooklyn. Uh, it's only tasting menu, right? So it's a curated thing. Uh, you know, it's a, I think it was a two hour seating, maybe a three hour seating. Uh, in any case, the kitchen is open. Whole restaurant is black with just like lights on the table, but the kitchen is open. And so then you do see, you see the art being made and then you taste the art. This is the first time in my life I'd ever had anything like that. I've done good tasting menus before, you know, omakase sushi from phenomenal sushi chefs and all mind blowing and stuff. But this actually shattered my brain. Like really? I had never tasted anything like this. I had never had wine pairings or whatever, saw whatever they were pairing, like where it just explodes in your mouth. The whole thing was wild. But back to the pros in the wild, you're exactly right. Seeing an artist in their prime is like creating art in their prime is very rare and surfing gets it surfing gets it as a canvas yeah it we do and even when you film it and then publish it later it loses so much of its intensity right so yeah we can watch tom kern's first wave at jay bay and appreciate that for what it is that is nowhere near what it would what it would have been to have been paddling out and seeing it live from sea level you know it's a whole different speed intensity everything and so um it's just a real rare gift that we get. And I think that's what's exciting about the pros and the wild thing. Which is exactly true. And also like, again, not to harp, but why it's so sad to see them flattened in a place like Two Foot El Salvador, yeah. where when they're against each other, if they would throw Philippe Polito and who's he serving against, or did he beat him already? He Ian beat, Gentile? He beat Ian Gentile. Okay, but if, if you had Philippe Polito and Ian Gentile out there, and then you also had two average servers out there, uh, and you had a superheat of uh, the four of them. And then you could see what Fleet does on a wave versus what some normal guy does on a wave. Then maybe you could appreciate what Fleet is doing more. But to see pro versus pro in a bad wave, like the scale is already really up there. So it's yeah. everything's flattened now to a, you, your expectation is high. And it's just an utter waste, an utter, utter, utter waste of the talent and the playing field. Yeah, completely agree. Um, Talking about fine dining, I recently, there's a show, a podcast called uh, How I Built This, and the host interviews people about building a business, essentially, all different types of people. But he interviewed Thomas Keller recently, who also has a famous restaurant in New York called Per Se, but his most famous restaurant was the French Laundry in Napa Valley, Yauntville. And um, hearing somebody committed, you know, an artist talking about their craft. And I mean, he was at so much of the story is about building a business, which has nothing to do with the artistry of what he was doing. But what I loved about it was hearing somebody who's singularly committed to one thing. And his one thing is cooking because I, I try a bunch of different things all the time and then I get bored with them and even surfing. I'm not really committed to in a way that I want to be an expert or I could ever become no. an expert at it. You know, it's like, I'm interested in wine. So I dabble in that. I'm interested in food and cooking. So I dabble in that. I'm interested in running. So I dabble in that, but nothing gets my full attention. This guy is just like the only thing I do from the moment I wake up until the moment I go to sleep is as he put it, nourish people. And so that requires finding the best ingredients 
and learning methods for how to prepare that specific ingredient and then pairing it with other things to nourish people, you know? And it's like, wow, okay, if you commit 40 years to something like that, you're going to get pretty darn good at it. It's really I mean, incredible. It's, it totally is true. Like the average Joe, like jack of all trades, master of none kind of, you know, if you're, even if you're lucky enough to be a jack of, to do multiple things well, uh, you're never going to be like, who's an expert, you know, like no, the, you're an I intermediate. The, it's the yeah, intermediate at everything. Thing. Yeah. So the, those are the, the Bo Jacksons of the world who can, you know, play football and baseball well, but still that's both sports, right? Like yeah. who comes along and can direct a symphony and do something physical or whatever, like to be an expert at something means you have put in not just 10,000 hours, you have put in hundreds of thousands of hours, like perfecting this. Not only did you put the time in, you had to be really, really, really good to begin with. Like, yeah, no, matter have have how much, no, no matter how much time I spent learning to dance at this point, I would be a, if I spent the rest of, committed the rest of my life to dancing, I would be a intermediate dancer at the end at best, right? Like I don't, I don't have talent. So right. not only do you have to have exceptional talent, that is not, that's the starting point. Like that's the starting point is being way better than everybody else at this thing. And now you start climbing the hill. Exactly. Um, one other kook and current that somebody submitted, paying attention to the forecast. Mm. Actually, actually, that's not the right, I think they misphrased it. It would be the kook and current would be ignoring the forecast entirely. Yeah, I mean, that's true. That's true. Paying attention to the forecast is intermediate to have exactly. a window to serve. Yeah. Exactly. So he he went on to say kooks. They just don't know any better. So ignorance is bliss. They don't even know about the forecast. Currents, they just go surfing no matter what the conditions are. He went on to say, I lived with a bunch of former QSers for uh, a decade ago, and they just went surfing no matter what the conditions were. Average surfers, on the other hand, overly obsessed about forecasts, overthink it, tinker around on their phones and annoy their mates by discussing which break will be good, when and why. But then often they never end up even going. They surf check in circles and then end up paddling out at the same spot that they first checked after driving for an hour. Does that sound familiar? Um, sent from T. 100% true. Uh, this is a gold submission here. Because uh, I think also currents. Not only are they blessed with uh, wild ability, they're also blessed with, I think, an innate understanding without checking of knowing what's happening. Like, for example, down by my house, down kind of by the Seaway, uh, it's a beach breaky zone called George's, which maybe gets good. I'm not even going to say how it does not get good often. I'll put it that way. Uh, one day I accidentally was there and it was like all time, right? It was like, hey, if I mean, in my memory, probably wasn't exactly this, but it was head high running barrels, right? It's like the sand had shifted right. It was crazy. Boom. And, you know, I think I was alone. There was a couple guys down the beach, maybe, and out paddles. Oh, I was with Derek Riley, actually, I think. And uh, out paddles right next to us, Damien Hobgood, just, hey, boys, and, uh, you know, proceeded to just rip it. But Damien doesn't surf there a lot. Damien just knew. Damien knew that this was going to be the all time day right here, right now. He didn't need to look at Surfline, didn't need to look at Windy, didn't need to look at anything, just knew in his heart. Go surf Georgia's right now. Spidey sense tingles. He was sitting yep. at home and he got the sense and boom, he's out there. Yep. Speaking of pros in the wild, I remember seeing, I was probably 19 years old or so, um, one of the Hobgoods. I don't know if it was Damien or CJ because I couldn't tell and they had all the same sponsors back then. But yeah, paddling out at like 56th Street, Newport with it was like a lot of South swell. And when that happens there, it's just the waves are so fast. It's like barreling waves and there's so much current pushing that you can never stay in position. And the waves are so fast. You can't make any of them anyways. And I was blown away at how a fast he paddled and B how fast he surfed. These waves were unmakeable for anybody else. And he was zipping out into the lineup paddling so fast that he was maintaining position and getting out to the exact takeoff zone that he wanted every single time. And then making the waves, getting crazy barrels, threading them through, you know, the entire length of the jetty from one jetty to the next, kicking out, paddling back out and doing it again. 
Otherwise, for every other person in the lineup, it was a conveyor belt of current that they could not surpass. Everybody's getting swept down the beach north, you know? And I was like, holy cow, it's a totally different level. I mean, it truly is. Yeah. Pros in the wild. Pros in the wild. There it is. And two approved submissions, I believe, ignoring the Definitely. forecast and painting your surfboard. Only kooks and currents do. Phenomenal. I love that because I thought that we had capped out. I thought there was going to be, but the, the, this yawning middle ground is huge and a lot of things out there left to be found. Sweet. Well, uh, we've got one of everybody's favorite segments. Um, we're on a different recording platform, so I don't have my theme music queued up, but tools to live by brought to you by Vayer watch is our promo code has changed. As I stated previously, it's splendor. 15 now, but that'll save you 15%. Uh, Veyer is spelled V-A-E-R, veyerwatches.com. I've got mine right here. This thing kept me active in Mexico last week entirely uh, and actually powered it up. I mentioned, I think previously to you that I think it's 30 minutes of direct sunlight on the dial powers the watch for six months, <laughs> believe it or not. That's crazy. It's incredible. And this thing got direct sunlight for a week straight. So I think I'm good to go for years probably now. I'll tell you what, listeners, Father's Day is this Sunday and nothing beats a solid wristwatch as a Father's Day gift. Masculine, cl classic, like not fussy. Yeah. So if you're a female listener, get one for the man or the father in your life and or male listener get one for your dad get one for yourself your father yeah i agree and it won't get there by father's day if you order it now but who cares give it late give them a gift it with a picture matter. of it i mean i feel like more We're often men. more often than not we give gifts now that are like oh it'll be here on monday like we ordered it it was a little bit late everybody knows that's what happens it's fine and we are all men and especially if you're a father who has time to be to be fussily preparing for gifts to arrive on time no we Nobody. Get gifts late, and we're happy about it. Yeah, you had to wait for David and Chaz yeah. to publish a podcast to tell you about Valentine's Day or Father's Day and give you advice sure. on what to get. Okay. Uh, but when you do order your Veyer watch using promo code SPLENDOR15, you do get free USA shipping, by the way. Easy returns, waterproof warranty, of course. And by the way, how much do you love the click of the bezel? The bezel. I use, I use my bezel. Do you use your bezel? I don't really, but... Oh, I do. I'll time stuff. Yeah. It is fun to do, yeah. but I just love like a real toothy, gritty click. Yep. It's good. Uh, okay. We have a submission this week. Somebody needed advice on, um, well, I'll just play it for you. Let's see. You know, what's up, David? What's up, Chaz? James from the Jersey Shore here calling for the grit because I got a barrel or not. Nah. Or maybe a tool to live by. There it is. Parking lot ding repair. So you roll up to the spot and you notice a new one, new crack or ding or gash or whatever. What is the move? This is the tool to live by part. If you do repair it, what's your go-to? Is it sun cure, sticker, chunk of wax, duct tape, whatever? Is it kookier to do some like weird crappy repair? Or is it kookier to take on water? Keep up the work later. It's a great question, David Lee Scales. It is indeed. And um, I feel like we've brushed up against this topic at various times, but we've never addressed it head on. What's your advice? What do you do firstly? And then what's your advice? Show up to the beach and you recognize a new ding in your surfboard. You only have the implements that are in your vehicle. I mean, my thing, of course, is to jam wax in there. It's an instinct that dies hard. I've been told over and over again, do not do that. Not only do you not keep water out, you make the whole thing worse. So when you do get it, if you take it to get properly repaired, or if you're going to do it, you just made it the whole thing worse, right? I cannot help. My mind doesn't understand how wax doesn't keep water out. So I just keep doing it. That's my go-to. And maybe I'm going to call bull roar on all those pseudoscientists who would say, maybe it's just the cartel of, of ding repairs who want to say it doesn't work, even though it works perfectly. So that's what I do. Uh, big, I recommend big it ding well. repair. 
Big ding repair is out to get you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what I do. Uh, what you cannot do, I will say, is A, not go surfing. Like your surfboard is there to be surfed. If you, unless it really stinks and you're, there's like severe damage somehow that your board bounced around in the bed of your Toyota Tacoma so badly that it like broke the nose off or something. Uh, but if there's good surf, and you're going to waste time fussing over a proper repair in the parking lot, then you've got a problem. You are yeah. an OCD type person, which is great. OCD is a wonderful thing, but uh, you just got to get out there and surf. So yeah. if you bite well, the bullet, you get out there and surf. I've got a solution that's worked well for me. And um, it's the sticker. The sticker, uh, I was going to say, there was a time in my life where duct tape did fix everything, but that was a young, immature time in my life. And what I learned from that time was that it's a temporary fix, but it's the ugliest possible thing that you can do. And then when you try to take that tape off, there's so much adhesive Goop. stuck. Yeah. The goop. And the sticker is just a better solution. Full stop. The other thing is I get a lot of stickers being adjacent to the surf industry and having connections with brands. I end up with a bunch of stickers. I'm never putting a sticker on my car. I'm never slapping it on a street sign. I'm not vandalizing anything with it. So I have this stack of stickers that I have no other thing to do with. It is the perfect solution for ding repair. And it ends up becoming a permanent solution for me. I always say of like, oh, I'm going to peel this off and go get it, drop my board off and get it fixed somewhere. I never end up doing that. The sticker stays and guess what? It, the adhesive works. It does stay. It doesn't come off over time. It's a permanent solution. The real truth of the matter is with, and I get, I get that if you have some, you know, hand shaped, uh, what, uh, I can't even like, what's an, what's a real expensive board these days. If you have a Ryan Birch hand shaped yeah, from yeah. Ryan yeah, and you ding it, I could see you wanting, you know, that's expensive and you wanting to take care of it, you know, properly. I think for most of us though, let's be honest, let's be real honest here. Uh, how, <laughs> Brian, David Lee Fields, uh, how long is that board going to last? Your boards are essentially disposable. I mean, right. they last for two or three years, right? Is that crack taken on water or, and or poorly repaired really going to lengthen the life of that board so much that you're going to surf it a ton longer? Yeah. Like it's going to keep your resale super high so you can resell it, right? Like anybody who's what, like, a board lasts, let's be generous and say a board lasts between two and three years. It's very generous. That ding is not going to, and especially let's just all be honest about the way we surf. Not only is it going to not really suck your performance level, you know, it's just so whatever. Stick wax in it, sticker it up. It's all the same. So this is... Um not an advertisement, but John LaLanne, Jack LaLanne's son, surfboard shaper, John LaLanne, gave me this roll of ding tape. And it is essentially a sticker. It's a it's just a roll of tape, clear tape, but it's specifically designed for board repair. Perfect. How cre incredible is this? How, where do we send people to get that I, dude, magic I product? I mean, honestly, I think when he gave it to me, he said that he was like distributing it for the company. So maybe it's on John LaLanne's website. Uh, yeah, John LaLanne. Um, but it's the product I'm reading it right now is just called Clear Ding Tape. So if you Google Clear Ding Tape, and maybe if you're in the US, you can get it through John LaLanne. But it's an incredibly simple invention that solves this exact problem. And it can be permanent because... Uh, you, I mean, I, you can leave it on there instead of getting the board repaired because it's clear. So it's just like, it doesn't show the ding, you know, it doesn't show the, um, it just, uh, whatever, you know what I'm saying? It's perfect. The, uh, take that right in your kisser, big ding repair. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm so glad to stick it to the man. Yeah, I know. I don't know. <laughs> um, if you're going to go chase this down, I, the other thing I hate is like, if this is a $5 product, you're really going to go and buy something online for five. It's more of an add-on product. So if John is distributing this, he needs to figure out a way to get this into retailers so that somebody can just throw it in with the cart when they're buying yep. a new leash and traction and everything else. It's hard to go to a website just to spend $5. Five you know bucks. I mean? Yeah. I mean, you can make a cool shirt with his dad on it, flexing. There you go.
There you go. So anyways, that is our solution for tools to live by. You come here, we give you the goods, tell you about ding repair tape. Uh, Vayer watches though. Thank you so much for supporting the program. And I know a bunch of people have actually supported them and gotten watches. And I have not heard one negative thing yet. Nothing but positive reviews from Bayer watches. So that thing keeps better time than my computer. Yeah, it really does. That was one thing I read on their, um, one of the reviews that was actually written on their website from a customer said, he's like, I'm a watch nerd. And, uh, I got to say, like this thing is fully over delivered compared to all the other watches in my, that I've collected, like keeps better time than any of the automatic watches that I need to constantly reset. And it's just durable and it looks great. The materials used in construction are just world, you know, as good as anything. So Vayer watches promo code Splendor 15. Uh, do you want to bring back an old segment called True Grit or Clickbait Crap? I sure do. Let's do it. Quote, this is a two-parter. I'll yeah. start. Uh, quote, thoughts and prayers pour in for DJ Khaled as beloved plus-size musical artist suffers debilitating surfing injury, exclamation point. This was then followed by an article about a week later that said, quote, DJ Khaled fans round on popular surf tabloid with fangs bared after beloved musical artist described as quote plus sized exclamation point wow it's all true it is all true except for the debilitating part of dj Khaled's injury but i think he was debilitated by it he had to go get a massage but oh man brutal yeah he had to get a massage and maybe he was going to miss uh his next day of golf even though he said he was going to play through no matter what i didn't follow up to see if he was going to play through no matter what uh but he said when he was getting his, his massage i will be out there i will fight through this pain so it's all true. What was the injury? E uh, he was on an e-foil. He's lucky that it wasn't a lot worse, to be honest. He was on an e-foil, and the clip uh, on Instagram is him trying to get to his feet. Where have you e-foiled yet, David Lee Scale? I'm going next month. Not e, but I'm going foiling next month. Foiling. Okay. I, I would imagine, and I know from what I've heard, foiling is a bit difficult, right? Like yeah. the paddle in, the pop to your feet, the finding the point, the all of that. I've never been regular foiling, but e-foiling was not a quick study of things but was zero problem right like you have the weird trigger you like kind of z -z 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 get a burst of speed you kind of find your plane and then you just get to your feet you know and you look, maybe look like a lumbering fool the first couple times like dj Khaled did but anyway then it's all about finding your point right you're too far forward you're going to obviously nosedive you too far back the board shoots out which is the sort of deadly part because then the propeller and the foil and all the stuff is exposed right with you and the thing in the air so that's what dj color did popped out looks like he came and hit the board and then you know it looks like it could have been a proper serious injury but thankfully it just required a light massage but okay. yeah the, i think uh, i think i did the, see this clip now that you're describing it i just didn't know yeah. it was dj Khaled. but this is this was by far by far and away beach Crit's biggest story ever millions upon millions of people got infuriated by this one uh they felt that it was i'll tell you what i'll really tell you what beach grit is and I've, i wrote basically this in the second the follow-up about the dj Khaled fans rounding on beach grit for calling him plus size but uh the beach grit and this community these are walled gardens right like i think very few like we get new listeners, but people come in and know what they're getting. We Beach Grid is perpetually getting new followers, but they're people who I think sit on the sidelines for a minute and study study the thing and then start interacting. Uh, and so it's this community that's, I think, intelligent, that's thoughtful, you know, different opinions, but people share them in a meaningful and well-spoken way generally. And then, so I'll find it good. But when, for Beach Grid at least, when people who don't it's not their thing sneak under the wall and come in you realize how stupid people are how abjectly stupid people are like imagine getting served a story about dj Khaled falling on a foil and it not delivering upon expectation uh you've never seen this website before F feeling the need to go comment right about how you were ripped off how that's you know from this is five minutes of my life that I'll never get back. You know, even though you just made now, you added another three minutes 
to comment on the story that you've lost five minute reading from the people excoriating the writer who just happened to be me for, you know, like paragraphs of you are trash. You are a trash person for calling DJ Khaled plus size. How dare you? I wish you bad luck for the rest of your life, et cetera. You know, there was, I mean, hundreds, I think on that one of comments of people who weren't beach grit people swinging in and just, and I, like, it's truly funny to read them, but it also makes me sad how dumb, dumb, dumb. I don't like to think of myself as better than others. I don't like to think of most people as really dumb, but I realized that on the internet, People who interact, I guess on the internet, people who interact to things are dumb. Dumb yeah. as box is a rock. Think, think that somehow they need to weigh in on something. Like it's absurd, the stupidity. Yeah. Well, the impulse to weigh in on stuff and to call people names and like tell, put you in your place when they're coming into your sandbox, you know, is, yeah. is really an interesting thing to discuss. But I think that you're, you're right it's the stupidity that kind of blows my mind because I'm aware of Swifties, right? Like Taylor Swift. <laughs> and, and that's a play, that's a, that's a sandbox that I don't play in. And I understand yeah. that they all have their own language and they're all consensually kind of uh, living in this fantasy land where they get to geek out about something right and there's a there's a certain joy and just human quality in us that wants to geek out and have our own little language and dynamic and joshing one another about these little things that is idiosyncrasy that only we understand you know and so the inability for the person to land on beach grit and to realize that there's a sandbox here that people are playing in that they have their own unique <laughs> language in the inability for them to realize that is completely dumb. It is what you said. It's stupid for them to not acknowledge that and to think that they are going to then chime in in this debate and put you in your place so that you don't do this bad behavior again. That's the incredible part. I mean, that, yeah, somebody said, like, it was on and on about, of course, this is bad journalism. You know, you should be fired from your job, et cetera, et cetera. And somebody said, I bet this person thinks they're a real journalists. I bet they wear a lanyard around that says journalist on it or something like that and i came in on that one and said whoa whoa let's keep things above the belt here that you know <laughs> we need to keep things like hey you know and then the amount of comments from that of like you dumb idiot person bad journalist you are that you're the baddest you dumb like the, the amount of people who read that who read that and then think like oh we got him now you know we're gonna really go tell him what it is i'm thinking have you guys never, ever, ever even heard the word sarcasm? Or right. do you not understand satire at any level? Mm -hmm. Or like these basic sort of literary things, and you just realize it's just, I mean, people are, and especially I think more and more on the internet, practically illiterate. They can yeah. read words and they can, or they can read letters, but their minds are illiterate where yeah. they just, there's zero understanding. The lack of self-awareness too, and the hypocrisy of, I know that those exact people have their own sandbox that they love that, you know, when they get together with friends for cocktails or whatever, it's their own banter that if was if it was taken out of context, they would be canceled or fired from their jobs or whatever it is. So the fact that they have so little self-awareness that they do this exact thing and they entered your world and they're not aware that they're in somebody else's little world and they can give them a little bit of grace is crazy. I mean, it's mind boggling, but yeah, so, that story. Well, thank well, you, DJ so, Colin. Yeah, and so the other detail here that we should have focused our discussion on is calling him plus-sized <laughs> is an accurate description right I mean, it's huge and yeah. it's polite it's a polite yeah. way to describe his you know corpulence <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> and so and so it's hilarious that of all things that's what they hone in on to say how dare you state the obvious to everyone I mean, like the, it's, it's, we're living in an amazing time where that becomes a problem. Well, and that, that is considered body shaming. That's considered, you know, that's what everybody, or, you know, 90% of the comments were, how 
dare you bring up his body, you know, like blah, 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 where just taking a few steps back, the, we're, the fact that we're not allowed to talk about bodies anymore at all, right? You cannot describe how somebody looks anymore at all without, for a huge part of the population, without being over the line, right? Yeah. Which is what, like, I wasn't using it as an insult. I wasn't, you know, of course, obviously I was using it facetiously, uh, which maybe that my facetiousness just obviously, you know, oozes through the computer screen. But still, it is patently absurd that you, if I called him, you know, giant fat ass DJ Khaled, then I could see how people would say, yeah. hey, man, that's not cool. Like, right. yes, he is. But that's not that's not a cool way to talk to that's that's me. Uh, but yeah, it's the same diff now as saying plus size. Yeah. It's the same as calling somebody a real fat ass. Uh, by the way, your new your new bestie, Jonah Hill. Yeah, I went I was watching the old film Funny People. Yeah. Do you remember Funny People? I do. Yeah. It wasn't a very funny movie. But it's really good. You know, it's like yeah. when you watch Judd Apatow, like he, Judd Apatow, I think, got famous for making very funny movies, but he's changed his tone to make kind of poignant films that have yeah. comedy in them, you know? But yeah, the movie, I think that title was a little bit tongue, tongue in cheek because it was a somewhat serious movie. Uh, but anyways, Jonah Hill, Seth Rogen, they're all in it as well. Adam Sandler's the lead. Jonah Hill was at his most rotund at that time. And Seth Rogen used to be large. He had lost a bunch of weight. And so this was the first movie he was in where he had lost a bunch of weight. Anyways, Jonah Hill has a joke in the film where he's talking to Seth Rogen and he says, you're, you're not funny anymore since you got skinny. You can't be skinny and funny. Jonah, and then I feel like 10 years later, just two or three years ago, Jonah Hill was angry at everybody telling him that he was too skinny and that he's no longer funny. It was a complete reversal of opinions from Jonah Hill. The words coming out of his mouth, him making the joke, were now being leveled upon him two years ago, and he was offended by the joke. But I wonder if it's true. I wonder if it's true, because Jonah is now making serious films, right? I know, Paul, yes. Like he's a more a more serious actor. Yeah. When I ask Jonah Hill, is it, is it a, can you be skinny and funny? Well, you certainly can. You could be skinny and funny. There's plenty of skinny comedians, but the question is, can you go from being plus sized to skinny and still be funny? Mm, this is a, sounds question. like a, another movie that Jonah Hill needs to make. This it exploration sounds, right here. It, it sounds like a potential conversation that could get us canceled. But I just, yeah. I also felt like, Jonah Hill, you're not allowed to be offended. If you made the joke 10 years ago, you are now not allowed to be offended by the joke that's being made about you, even though it's not really a joke. It's true, but I wonder if... I know he was, by the way, reading a script. It was Judd sure. Apatow's joke that he was delivering as a scripted character, but it's still, if that clip resurfaced, it could be pushed in his face, you know? I wonder with Jonah, though, if Jonah went through a moment of like being hypersensitive, but he doesn't seem hypersensitive anymore. I mean, he obviously quit social media but good right i mean if you could quit social media would you i can and i should but we, i i, I can't. yes the I answer is yes can't, but you can yeah you can't for the same reason i can't is because this is how we speak to the world our world like the yeah, dms and all that if, if that went away then i would lose you know a major like i use it as a communic communication tool yeah. If you're famous like Jonah, you don't need the communication tool, right? right? You don't need people, like people will find you uh, if they need to, right? And so there's no need. And like famous people with Instagrams who like either get in trouble or famous people with social media who get in trouble or do anything, unless it's like really pushing their business, I'm like, why? Why do you have it? Like, what are you getting out of this thing? throw that out the window and i think jonah did and probably feels so much better because of it right where i wonder if the hypersensitivity hypersensitivity partially was just coming through having this idiotic platform that again congress and scientists and everybody is realizing more and more and more is highly damaging like this is not yeah. a benign tool like this is a toxic toxic tool that we created and 
really nobody should be on it. I mean, we should figure out a way to use it to communicate, but without like the extra stuff. I mean, I just wish there was one that you didn't have to like post. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I guess it's probably called email. Yeah, uh, <laughs> entirely agree. Like it is a net loss. It is gonna. It generates more. Uh, I don't know what mental kind of issue, emotional, mental kind of issues than, than yeah, than it's worth really the convenience of it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't think that I've read something that kids are no longer on it. Like what, when they talk about the toxic, you know, social media stuff to, I don't know what generation it'd be. It'd be like, you know, whatever, 10 to 13 year olds, whatever. Uh, their biggest beef with it is their parents are always on it like that's what yeah that's what frustrates them is they can't get their parents attention because their parents are doom scrolling uh but they're not on it like they're not on social media saw this epic clip this morning of a little kid staring at her phone and she had one of those you know those little birthday blowers that you put in your mouth and it's like a rolled up piece of paper and you blow air into it and it unrolls like a lizard's tongue kind of so she had the phone that distance away from her and she was blowing it into the Instagram screen. And as it unrolled, it would scroll the screen up one image and then she'd blow it again and it would scroll the screen up one image. Oh, that's awesome. The birthday blower was scrolling for her. That's perfect. That's what we need. That's that's the level of, of uh, care that this whole thing deserves. Yeah. Is a birthday blower scrolling it up. I know. And here I am entertained by it. That's how I'm using yep. my time. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, let's go to a commercial break so we could talk about a rebranding of everybody's favorite, uh, one of everybody's favorite longtime products and sponsors here. And then we'll be back with, of course, Barrel or Not. All right, Chess Smith, we dare not say its old name. We must only refer to everybody's kind of most important dietary part of their day as AG1. It is no longer. It is AG1, and that's all it is, and that's all it will be forevermore. There's no even such thing anymore as, because all we have is AG1. And that's all we need, David Lee Scott. It's all it should have been all along. I mean, here's the deal. And it's a a new website. It's a new portal. If you go to the old one, it'll still direct you to the new one. But for the record, it is drinkag1.com slash surf is the new portal. And here's the reason behind the rebranding is it's so much more comprehensive than just a greens powder. If you just call it a greens powder and you think, oh, you're getting your greens from it. No, it's immune boosting. It's gut system fortifying. It is brain activating. And so it's it's a comprehensive solution for your diet and your well-being it's more than just for athletic people too i mean true would imagine you don't have to be very athletic to enjoy all of the health benefits that no. ag1 brings no. you'd be You'll... sitting at home gaming and still <laughs> you need your ag1 from kook to val to lifelong intermediate to curran ag1 benefits everyone and the other thing about it is what well, ag1 drinkag1.com slash surf of course but the other thing about ag1 is that um you know so many people get it whatever category of the market you're talking about people get into the market with a product and then they develop a second product and a third product and they have this suite of products ag1 every step of the way has just invested in the original product but improved the recipe with modern science and what science is saying, you know, the human uh, diet needs and with better quality products as well. So they've reinvented the formula, updated the formula 52 times since the product's been introduced over 10 years ago, and they will continue to. So there's no need for AG2 or AG3 or any of that. It's just AG1 is the product. It's the same product. Focus on doing one thing well. This is what we were talking about with Thomas Keller earlier. Just commit to expertise in one area, and that's what they've done. Organic from New Zealand. I don't know those two things right there. That's all you need. If somebody said this is organic and it's from New Zealand, in. Totally. Tell me no more. Tell me no more. Go to drinkag1.com slash surf. Do your own research, but also 
uh, you'll be convinced because everybody always is super. Simple. What is what is the slash surf drink ag one dot com slash surf? What does the slash surf get you? Good question. Uh, I think it's five free travel packs and a year's supply of vitamin D, which of course um, boosts you desperately your need. You, you desperately, desperately need, need in Southern California right now since the sun has not shown. Guess what? Did you know the sun has not been out in the morning in Southern California since February? No. New York, New York Times did a story. The sun has not shown in the morning in Southern California since February. Crazy. Yeah, yep. people so need- people will suffer from that. I mean, it's the mood elevator, right? And it yep. it also boosts your immune system. So that's what that vitamin D will do for you. So thank you, AG1. Drink ag1.com slash surf. Chaz, we're back for Barrel or Not. Great. Who is Barrel or Not brought to us by these days? <sighs> the one and only Buell Surf, BuellSurf.com. Buell Grit 25 is the promo code to save you 25% off. Which, and I got to say, get your dad or uncle or whatever, if you're the father in your life, a uh, veyer, then go get yourself and or everyone on your block a Buell because they're going to figure out that this 25% off is too much at some point and take it down. I would act fast on this one. 25% unheard of. 10% oh. normal, 15% good, 25 just doesn't happen. Totally. And of course, when we think wetsuits, we think, oh, cold water. No, you can also wear them. I mean, in Southern California, rarely can you simply trunk it. There's three weeks out of the year, maybe, where you could trunk it in the middle of the day. Otherwise, thin wetsuits. And so um, Buell has two millimeter wetsuits. They have tops, they have short sleeve, long leg, two mil suits. They have everything for every exact water temperature that you need. So where do they go? Buell Buell Surf. Buell Surf. BuellSurf.com. Promo code. Promo code. Buell Grit 25, the number 25. So Barrel or Nah, Chaz Smith, pricing things to end in 0.99. Oof. It's become so ubiquitous in all our lives. Was it the gasoline industry that started this? Is that where... This I mean, they, they go gas. one step further and put it at nine tenths of a penny after the yeah. 99. Yeah, 0.99 nine tenths, which is just the fact that I suppose the other theme of this show could be stupidity. The fact that we're all so dumb and see 4.99 and nine tenths gas and say, oh, gas is at four bucks. Like, that's what I say. I see the first number and I say, go, uh, that's the number. Right. Uh, so I suppose as long as people are as stupid as we are, then I'm going to be a barrel on the 0.99. You're wrong. I'm going so no barrel. Here's what I appreciate. Don't treat me like an idiot. If it's $24.99, yeah. price it at 25 bucks, and I will come and support your store. You're also saving ink. You're probably saving some space on the sticker that that thing had to get printed on times a thousand of stickers in the store. You know what I mean? Like, just keep it, call it what it is. I'm happy for the convenience. I'm happy for the simplicity and not treating me like an idiot. I am so dumb though, that I'll feel good walking out of the store, spending 24 bucks and feel bad walking out of the store, spending 25, even though I just spent 25. Exactly. I'm dumb, dude. All I'm right. dumb. All right, we're going to split decision on this one. Yep. Keep keep me dumb. Okay. Um, this was already in the notes, but it relates to kind of what we were talking about earlier. Men uh, asking a server for a substitution on the menu for a man. Man doesn't, asking or doesn't anyone? doesn't matter. I'm just saying it's listed as something on the menu, and you're going to ask them to omit a certain ingredient out of the dish. I'm going to say this is fair game for our female listeners. And for since this is Pride Month, for our men who would like to be female listeners, this is also okay for you. If you are, though, a man, you order off the menu as is. If you don't like something, you do not take it off either. You eat that thing. You are not a four-year-old baby. You are an adult male. Order your food as it's written and eat it. If it has something, if you have a peanut allergy and the salad has peanuts, then don't order that salad. Even if you really, really want that salad, you order something you can eat. Exactly. And eat it. 
Exactly. That's exactly right. I was going to say allergies aside, but no, even if you have the allergies, you just order a different dish. You cannot eat that dish then. If you have an allergy to it, you, you that is, the dish was not made for you. Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. I am full anti-substitutions, whatever. And the reason why is you think you know everything about every food food product on the planet and how it interplays with other food products on the planet. You don't. You don't know everything. You're now in a restaurant where somebody specifically designed something with their level of expertise. And guess and you're what? You're saying I'm smarter than you. No, you're not. It might be time for you to learn something new. And it is childlike to think that you your palate is, you know, knows everything. And so open yourself up to new opportunities and you might be delighted. In fact, I would argue I will, you will be delighted. I will say for fussy women, it's all good. This is a barrel for you. Go, go get barreled in the, I would like the vin, raspberry vinaigrette, but could you swap out the walnut for a candy pecan and da, 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 Screw all like, you. Screw how about you. It? How no. about it, fussy lady? <laughs> no. So my buddy, I could probably pull like two weeks worth of barrel or nas out of this story from my buddy, <laughs> but he, um, it was his 25th wedding anniversary this past week. And do you know, uh, Tamu Solani's restaurant in Laguna? He has like a steakhouse. Yeah. Yeah. It's called Solani's, um, fancy steakhouse on PCH in Laguna. Right. So they're going to go there for his 25th anniversary. Next day I text him. I'm like, Hey, how did it go? He sent me this long review five paragraphs long woven into each paragraph was a complaint about his wife of 25 years. <laughs> so it starts off with, it was a great night, but you know, my wife wasn't ready to go when I was ready to go. So instead of leisurely having taking a drive down PCH, we had to book it and rush to make our dinner reservation. Then they sat us outside on the patio and pretty much right away, a group of motorcycles went by revving their engine. So my wife complained and had us move our table to the inside. It just goes on and on and on. And it's like, you know what? If you've been married for 25 years, you're entitled to the complaint. I have a feeling like you annoy, you annoy each other at this point, but you're all in. Like you're, yeah. you're going to complain, but you're still having a great night. It's just part of what it is at 25 years, right? Is it, ain't it weird when you read of like the celebrity who gets divorced after, like Kevin Costner, I think just got divorced at 30-ish years, I want to say, something like that, tw tw over 20. Yeah. Uh, if you've gone that long and there's not like a major infi infidelity or something, like, so what you're annoyed with the person? Like, yeah. Yeah, because you've been together for 25 years. You're going to be a little more annoyed after 25 yeah. more, but you think swapping out now that you're going to, you're done. You're, this was your person and you were going to go like, you know, wander around. You can go find a, like Al Pacino and that newer, whatever, the 29 year old, 83, 83 and 29 is like, I mean, there's gross and there's super gross. And then there's like old man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Old man, saggy butt, gross. 29 and 83. And she was with Mick Jagger at 79 when she oh. was 20, 22. So she's got an angle she's playing. Oh, that's a hard to figure out what. Well, the one that, uh, to finish that story, my buddy, the final paragraph was, uh, we ordered creme brulee for dessert. But of course, my wife asked them to put the berries on the side because she doesn't eat fruit. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, whoa. Your grown ass wife, she's a doesn't full adult, doesn't eat fruit. Like that is offensive to me as a human being. And it, it's not like she doesn't eat durian. You know what I mean? It's berries, blueberries and strawberries, the most delicious things on the planet. And she just has a full moratorium against them. Hold on though. Here's not to, not to take more time than we need, but I had a, a epiphany the other day, an epiphany. Uh, I was, I am a massive berry buyer, right? I go, every time I go to the store, I get the organic strawberries, the organic blueberries, the organic raspberries, and oftentimes the organic blackberries. I'm running like, I don't know what, a 20, 30 bucks per grocery store run, right? Wow. On berries alone. Uh, probably not that much, but somewhere, you know, whatever. Organic berries, berries. ain't cheap, yeah. yeah. Uh, I can't recall 
the last time I had one of them. I feed them to obviously daughter like mows through them like it's going out of sound. I was thinking this is a good healthy, you know, energy, vitamins, blah blah blah. And then I was wondering. I thought I haven't had one of these. They're sitting there. It's not like she's eating them all, and I couldn't have some. I never once served myself up berries. Every once in a while, I eat a banana, an orange. Every once in a while. But then I thought to myself, is fruit for children? To your friends, wives, like, is fruit not an adult food? Is it something you grow out of? The sweetness, you know, you know, it's just let's leave it for the kids. So maybe she was making the ultimate adult move by saying, I would like the creme brulee, but since I'm, adult, I'm, I'm an adult, leave off the berries. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting point. But <laughs> if the sweetness is what she's trying to avoid, and then she's cracking through the sugar crust of the creme brulee, then I don't think that applies here. I, I mean, I was literally offended. And I think he wove again that sentence in because it annoyed him too. Like he had yeah. to share it with us to commiserate together, you know, be like, how annoying is my wife? She doesn't eat fruit, you know? <laughs> but I was, I'm like, man, of all the menu substitutions, I can understand you don't like the, po the potent flavor of a truffle, let's say, in your yeah. whatever it is. And so you ask for them to not put, but a berry is the least offensive thing. And in fact, harmonious with creme brulee you know what i mean that is, like that it is true. absolutely enriches the creme brulee experience it enhances That's yeah true. and you add a little bit of whipped cream to that mixture and boom it's a symphony of flavor that she has just completely denied herself of so, off and running yeah so let me just say no menu substitutions if you want the complete symphony uh final barrel or not nah, i already know your answer on this one um bringing a bottle of water everywhere you go. So nah, so zero nah. Like the hydration freak that's going on, I get it, drink your water. When you're home, drink a big old glass of water, go out into the world. You're not going to thirst to death out in the world away from your water. You're, the people who have their big old jugs with the markings, you know, like you've seen the ones like the pithy ones too, like, Way to go. You're looking better. Right. You know, days half done. You should be here. Let's sprint to the And it's like the biggest jug of water ever. Nobody needs that. That's disgusting. You are treating your body super weird. Your body doesn't need that. Like drinking normal human amount of water, one cup in the morning and call it good until you get to dinner and drink half of your glass of ice water with dinner. That's it. Well, that's all. That's the only amount of water people need. I, so this is where we deviate. I agree with the philosophy of everything you said, but I disagree with the water intake. I think water is the ultimate healing thing in life and it's fantastic for your body. So hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. But when is my point of bringing a bottle everywhere is when is water not available to you? If you're going to be walking around New York city all day today. Water is available five times on every block through little bodegas and Rite Aid and everywhere, every restaurant you go into, you do not need to lug around a hydro flask with you all day long, every day for every car ride. You know, even if it's a two hour ride, even if you're going to the mountains or the desert, when you're in Southern California, you can last for two hours until you get to your destination. You don't even need water in the car, right? I'm an, I'm an ecologist though, so I don't want to buy my plastics. I'm saying the human body needs one glass of water in the morning and half a glass of restaurant ice water with dinner. That's the only water you need all day. You are an ecologist? Yeah, I'm, no I'm, not, gonna buy oh, okay. I'm not gonna buy plastic water bottles out. I'm going to save the environment while drinking the proper adult, the scientifically recommended amount of water. One glass in the morning, half a glass of ice water and or sparkling water with dinner and evening, one and a half classes. Which scientist recommended that amount? <laughs> uh, the, I just, when we were young, this thing did not exist, right? No, I mean, I no. never heard the word hydration for the first 15 years of my life. And purchasing disposable water bottles was a luxury that was afforded to the one percent up until I turned 15. Like that didn't even exist. You and we all survived. Drink. We all survived. You saw somebody drinking a bottle of Evian, and I thought that is the richest person in the entire world right there. They're, if they're they drinking must a have, bottle of they were, they were in the oil business. 
It was the only way that they afforded that bottle of Avion, you know, and now it's ubiquitous. Now water bottles are everywhere. And I'm bringing this up, talking about my friend being annoyed by his wife. I'm bringing this up because it's a constant part of our conversation. Anytime we go anywhere now is like, do you have your water? Did you get water for Austin? We'll be walking the dog midway through the walk. She wants to bust out and give the dog some water. I'm like, yeah, the, dog the, dog, water. the dog is honestly utilitarian. The dog can exist days without water. I won't do that to it, but it can. Like it does not need water mid walk because it's panting. That's not what the panting's I, about, you know? I, I took my dog, uh, I mean, dogs here in New York, but last time I flew to New York, I think I left, something happened. A whole, something got all messed up. So I was like, really, it was a long day. It was like up at, you know, 4.30 a.m. or something, dog in the, kennel driving to the airport blah, 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 you know taking the dog out for walks and whatever to relieve itself but otherwise you know i got here i think it was like midnight or one or something uh dog ran in straight to the water and got a big old drink and i realized i hadn't given the dog a drink of water all for like it's like 18 hours or something like that this dog's fine dog survived yeah no worries yeah. now so you're revealing that you travel with your dog right now I just, I mean, I got a chihuahua. It's the easiest thing ever. It's easier to travel with the dog than to leave the dog at home. Man. It is so much easier. Dog doesn't make a peep on the plane. Just sits under the seat, quietly minding its business or gets kicked for me. Oh, well, I mean, that doesn't happen. But the, the kennel gets a light tap of the foot. Uh, so. And yeah. And then I don't have to worry about having somebody. Could you come over and feed the dog? So um, I've got two lines of thought before we close out. One is following a barrel or not from previous, maybe last year, talking about what do you do with the armrest on the plane? And you're like, hey, if you're in the middle of the seat, that's your privilege, right? The fact is, that you don't is. get the aisle, the fact that you don't get the window to lean your head against, the privilege for the middle seat is you get both armrests. So I was on the aisle seat on my last flight last week, and the guy in the middle seat took the armrest with a real aggressive certainty. Yeah, And I thought back to bear, I, I was offended by his assumption that it was his, right? But maybe he's a listener, maybe he heard barrel or not. So he took it and I go, okay, I'm going to let this one go. I'm not going to try to vie for power here. It is what it is. But his elbow was encroaching on my seat. He took so much armrest that his elbow is spilling over into my seat. So much so that I can't now put my right arm back into my position in my seat without touching yeah. arms with him, essentially. Yeah. So I was like, okay, what do I do here? How do I handle this? So I just like floated my arm forward for an hour. And then I was like, it's not comfortable anymore. I need to put my elbow back. So I wedge it back against my body and against his elbow. He thought I was showing an act of aggression and trying to angle for the armrest and like push his arm off the armrest. So he like buckles down, like pushes his like firm elbow down into the armrest. And I'm thinking to myself, well, isn't this a little tussle we've got going on with two silent grown males fighting elbows, right? He had his, he had a blanket pulled over his head. I think he was wasted or hung over from the night before. So he had a blanket pulled over his head and he was trying to sleep. He verbalized something under the blanket. Like, nah, nah, nah. And I just turned and looked to him talking now to a blanketed head and I go, I go, Hey, I'm not trying to wrestle the armrest from you. You're spilling over into my seat. I'm just, and I think I left it at that, you know? And then he like huffed something and then like softened his elbow a little bit so that I can have my position. But I was like, this is insane. Like this interaction that is happening here is would never happen anywhere else. He's got a blanketed head and I'm trying to, I'm having like a child fight on a schoolyard with this grown male. It was bizarre. I mean, the, the micro amount of microaggression that can happen on an airplane, like the little teeny turf wars are crazy. Like I will say to the, the like adding a, a layer to that uh, middle seat gets the armrest. It's true, but it's not for that person to take. It's for the people on the edges to give, right? So this is, this is how things work in perfect harmony. The window seat and the aisle seat gift the armrest to the middle seat. The middle seat doesn't take the armrest. Totally, totally. Because him taking it then put me in a different posture. Put me in a defensive like, posture. Your manhood is being threatened. 
dude, I'll give it to you. Like, I have no problem giving it to you, but the way that you went about this. Don't take it. Don't take it. Yeah. And now, and then the spilling over, now I have to do something about it. You know what I mean? It was insane. And it's like, when you're, you're also, everything's heightened because you are traveling that day, you know, and all the stresses that come with that. But by the time I got home and got some food in my system and a little bit of rest, I was just like, Oh my God, what a bizarre yeah. headspace I was in eight hours ago when I was dealing with that, you know? So funny. So, yeah. But at any rate, uh, barrel or not, bringing water bottles, we're going, nah. Nobody bring nah. water bottles anywhere you go. You're fine. Don't. You will be okay. We did it for the entirety of humanity up until the last five years. So deal with Glass it. Glass and a half water. Glass and science says glass and a half of water. Exactly. So the, the backup story that I had was an update on last week's feeding the cats thing. Yeah. Yesterday, yes. Lauren. Oh no, not yet. Last night or this morning, I can't remember. But Lauren, literally in bed, is like, man, it was this morning. She got up, came back to bed at six a.m. and she's like, man, my life is so much easier now. I got a water, an automatic water tower for the cats out front that they can. I just fill up once a week or whatever it is, and it just kind of distributes water for them. So much easier than when I had to bring those two bowls in and wash them every morning and then put new water in them. Wow. Kingdom is growing. <laughs> and there's kittens, by the way. Uh, update the from last are... week, there's two kittens now. Are they cute? Super cute, you know? But it, again, it's like, she goes, and she's like, you know, I'm, uh, I don't know. She had some positive spin on it. And I go, yeah, but those kittens wouldn't even be here if you weren't feeding the other ones in the first place. Like that's a result of, you know, I, I think she was saying she's going to trap the kittens and take them to the shelter, like to do good. And I go, yeah, but you wouldn't have to do that if you didn't feed the cats in the first place and they made babies, you know? I mean, those kittens, those kittens are getting straight up, like getting the air sucked out of them and sent for dissection kits around the, like those cats are not, those feral cats are not going to find a home. Except, you sh- here's what you should do. You ready? This I feel you've reached critical mass here, where you should say, "Hey, you get one of those kittens and keep it, but no more feeding the rest of them. Like you gotta chew the rest of them away because we're, our little feral is gonna get like chewed out by these well, these ones." There's no chance I'm winning that debate at this point. I'm not even engaging in the debate. I'm just inter- I'm using it all as entertainment for the podcast now. <laughs> um, the fact that there's a water tower out there that I'm sure it costs whatever thirty bucks. The fact that she was Amazing. washing washing cat dishes previously blew my mind too. I'm like, as if we don't Amazing. have enough dishes to wash already. I'm glad you found what a solution. You, but what if you faked uh, that Austin had cat cat scratch fever? What if you came in and said, like, you like research because cats, cat scratch fever is like real serious. Yeah. It's like a bad thing that happens, I think, quite often. And so if you, if you research it good enough where you can fake it good enough, you can do a whole fake, you know, emergency room run where you got the ice cream at the end. Surprise. But maybe that will teach you a lesson. Maybe that'll be like a little tough love, like scared okay. straight. I'll work on it. I'll get an airbrush and work on my yeah. airbrushing a rash onto his skin. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Scared straight. I think operation scared straight is what you need. I'm going to teach him how to fake cry and act annoyed. Yep. By, yeah. Okay. I like it. I like yeah. it. I'll go yeah. that direction. Sensitive to light, like hold a flashlight above his eyes and have him just like, oh, it hurts. It'll yeah. be a little father, father, son bonding yeah. opportunity here too. Father's Day project. I like it. Uh, yeah. Update for listeners. Um, Griffin Colapinto beat Liam O'Brien in the semifinals. So it'll be a Griffin Colapinto, uh, Felipe Again. Toledo redo of last year at the finals. Oh, and when then, are they in the water? Uh, I, I, in, the, in the next, in the next 20 minutes. Yeah. Caroline Marks is in the water right now against Taro, uh, Tyler Wright for the final. Okay. So, all right. Well, Hey, that means, uh, that officially, we just talked about surfing for today's show for the last two 30 seconds. And that qualifies as a surf podcast. Uh, thank you everybody for listening. Thank you. Buellsurf.com. Of course, drinkag1.com slash surf. And of course, veyerwatches.com. Thank you as well. Beautiful. Chaz, have a blast in New York. Thanks. I'll be here next week too. So we'll chat then. Also. Man, how long is your trip? It's like 11 ish days. Yeah, the School of American Ballet starts on Tuesday. So I'm acclimating a little bit and then should be right into it. Have a blast, man. Dine well. Thank you. Will do. All right. All right. Chat soon. Bon voyage.